Welcome to Professor Game Podcast, where we interview successful practitioners of games, gamification, and game thinking, who bring us the best of their experiences to get ideas, insights, and inspiration that help us in the process of getting the students to learn what we teach. And I'm Rob Alvarez. I teach and work at IE Business School in Madrid, where we create interactive and engaging learning materials. Want to know more? Go to professorgame.com slash subscribe, start on our email list, and ask me anything. So engagers, welcome once again, because today we have Albert, whom I've met several times at Gamification Europe. But before we get started, our Albert, are you prepared to engage? Oh, most definitely, Rob. I'm here to engage. <laughs> I'm sure we've both been looking forward to this for a while. And Albert van der Meer, which I'm guessing is the semi-decent pronunciation of your last name, he is a creative gamification consultant with, and this one I'm not going to get it right, is A.E. Stranger. I'm not sure how to say that, but <laughs> you'll correct me in a second. How do you pronounce A, a Stranger? It's just A Stranger. It's just that, that sort of letter combination, so it's A oh, Stranger. It's just an interesting interesting look for for the a and the e <laughs> yeah <laughs> so a stranger is operating and is based in the netherlands and he is specifically in the narrative visual entertainment and storytelling which you know all these skills knowledge albert has helped business educational institutions and other corporate environments to improve team cooperation develop deeper more meaningful learning experience through the use of narrative and gameful design techniques and he has also co-authored a book on gamification it's called press start using gamification to power up your marketing book offers a straightforward advice and immediate applicability of marketing and gamification techniques. It's aimed at marketers who wish to fully engage their customers in a positive and meaningful manner using game techniques. I'm sure we're missing a lot about your life and probably a lot about your, you know, awesome intro, but is there anything you'd like to highlight before we get started, Albert? No, I think it mostly covers it. Um, just one of the other things, I, I I don't come from a traditional gamification background, I guess, from some of your other guests on here who have maybe been behavioral psychologists and all of that. I'm more from a film background, so there's some psychology in there, so it's very visual narrative. That's where that comes in. But other than that, I think you you, you hit on everything that, you know, <laughs> that that's me, I guess. <laughs> In a nutshell, let's say yeah. so. So what would you say, and I know we are recording this during the COVID situation, but if you want to refer to COVID environment, pre-COVID environment, a hope for whatever post-COVID environment looks like, but what yeah. would you say is, is like a, the regular day, week, month? What, what does your schedule look like in general? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, so it's obviously changed with the whole COVID thing, but you know, my regular day would probably have started with, you know, quick caffeine hit a peanut butter sandwich breakfast of champions but uh <laughs> now prior to covid it was a uh, a regular day would be somewhere between working from home doing research writing and development and then going out and meeting clients and doing workshops and delivering workshops whereas like the current covid thing is far more research and writing and development for the hope of when covid ends because obviously with the whole social distance thing, thing and all of that, there's very little face-to-face. -face. But I'd say for the most part, it's working on coming up with ideas for workshops, how to use the sort of a gameful techniques and gamification with team building and learning and development. And now it's obviously I've moved a little bit more than I would have or would have moved more quickly than I would have before in terms <laughs> of bringing that into an online learning experience. And yeah, it's just around gamification, obviously gamification of marketing and bringing those sort of online now. So I guess that's probably my day today in a nutshell. It's fairly vague <laughs> in a sense, but yeah. <laughs> but it seems interesting enough and, you know, with sufficient things to keep you busy. I, mm. I don't know if you you observed something similar, but what I've seen, at least from social media, which is my only human interaction aside from my wife, what, what I've seen is there's two extremes. There's the people who are bored or something along those lines at home doing almost nothing. And yeah. those of us who have like literally no time off, <laughs> no, <laughs> busier than ever. Like, yeah. have you seen something similar or, or have you seen, you know, other things in between at least? Um, well, I've seen it from certain people, some, some friends maybe where it's, you know, they're, they're quite bored. Personally, I've probably become more busy, if not equally busy, but just in terms of like getting stuff done and working a lot more but yeah there's definitely a split in the populace in terms of uh yeah 
I have so much time. I'm working from home. This is like a vacation versus the other side, like you say, who are, you know, gunning down and, you know, making sure that when this ends, we're going to be right there for it. <laughs> <laughs> getting getting ready for the whole thing to end i mean definitely yeah. to be again to be perfectly fair and honest i could use more downtime i could just sit down and play games for an extra you know hour two hours three hours a day and no problem with that <laughs> yeah i mean i think it's also a very interesting position currently because there's a the level of like well everybody's working from home so you have a lot of people who think just keep going for it and yeah. you need to have that sort of discipline to choose of this is when i end this is the downtime yeah. I need. Otherwise, you're just going to burn through. Absolutely. Absolutely. In fact, one of the things that we're doing at home, both my wife and I who are working from home, is we're st being very strict about lunch. Like, mm. lunch is really that, you know, that hour. Yeah. And we, like, try to see an episode of something which lasts at least 40 to 40-something minutes. So that yeah. those 10 minutes of preparation or warming up the food... Um, make it for the hour to like have that actual break which to be perfectly fair at work i sometimes took the break for 15 minutes maybe mm. <laughs> sometimes no break <laughs> having lunch at your desk which yeah. is uh, you know not ideal at all um no. but i'm trying to instill that discipline to myself uh, yeah. one of the things perhaps i miss most is i had the chance to walk from work to home Mm. So those 20, 30 minutes for me were pff, beautiful. Like 20, 30 minutes one way, 20, 30 minutes the other one. I could literally yeah. disconnect one world from the other and just forget what happened. <laughs> yeah, and just have like a little bit of personal time and reflection. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, well, I'm substituting. Well, not substituting. I already did it, but I'm, I'm focusing a bit more on my meditation to have that sort of split in a way. But, you know, okay. it's never going to be the same as <laughs> physical activity. No, no, not being outside <laughs> in the fresh air. <laughs> So, Albert, we like to, as you know, and you, I know you've heard at least a couple of episodes before, you yeah. know, we like to start strong with one of those, you know, <laughs> failure or first attempt in learning stories. So we would like to know if you have one of those, which I'm convinced that all of us humans do have at some point, but especially, of course, in the gamification or the game-based world, one of those stories of, you know, you went for something, it didn't work or it just crashed down and what did you learn from it? How did you, you know, get back up or how did you turn it around or whatever that looks like? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously, I had, uh, like many others, uh, several failures, probably. And uh, I think probably one of the ones that I, I wanted to touch on, which is sort of an overall theme in terms of things that I believe that when you're working with gamification or you're using game thinking, is, you know, you always need to get the pulse right with the client or, you know, a partner who you're working with. So um, I won't name any names, obviously. But, <laughs> That's good. Uh, <laughs> Working with a, a professor from a business school approached me wanting to create a sort of gamified team building experience that fit within their management workshop. And this is, I mean, it's escape rooms are still quite popular, but this is a few years ago when they got really popular. And they wanted something like an a la escape room style creative puzzle solving experience that would last for half a day to a day and sort of created the entire thing around it. And they seemed interested enough. Obviously, the, the outcome of the story is that they didn't go for it for various reasons. I won't go in too much, but one of the ones was that it wasn't really reconciled between what I thought they wanted in terms of the learning objectives versus what they thought was more of a game experience and a bit of a fun day. And it's really sort of making sure that you hit those points correctly and not go past each other in sort of the you know ships in the night kind of thing. And and I think that's probably it's one of the one of the earlier ones. And that gave me a lot of learning in terms of like, yeah, make sure you discuss this and you check a lot beforehand. And in fairness, I should have seen it coming from a film background as well. If you're doing pitches and you want to have, uh, you know, a music video or a short film, you know, you keep asking questions. But, you know, there was <laughs> there was maybe the, a disconnect in terms of like the, the transition period of like, oh, yeah, I know exactly what they want. They want learning because they're from a business school. But no, they wanted the team building aspect. So I think that was a that was a, may, a minor disconnect. And obviously, to elaborate on that idea, I'd since then play tested the concept as well, just to see if it actually worked in its own right. And the the amusingness of it is, I, I play tested it with some friends initially, just to see how they work through it. And they only got through about twenty five percent of it after three <laughs> hours, so that wouldn't have worked. And then a we, few weeks later, I asked them, yeah, so any more feedback now that you've had time to reflect on it? And they're like, oh, 
what was it again? I was like, you know, the, the team building <laughs> thing with the with the puzzles and, and like, oh, the Egyptian game. Because I'd use the Egyptian mythology as sort of a narrative to weave it all through and they've forgotten all the other learning objectives. I just remembered the narrative. <laughs> so, <laughs> so well, great that, storytelling, I'm guessing. Yeah, it was clearly the storytelling was much better than the learning objectives were. So I think in terms of like, that was a very specific failure and it gave me a lot of learning in terms of, yep, I need to have very targeted concepts of what this is and what people want and not to shift too much probably in my own comfort zone in terms of like, oh yeah, I want to tell a great story and everybody will enjoy it. (laughs) Just because it's a good story, but you know, yeah, I completely agree with the importance of understanding what your customer, client, partner or yourself, what it is that you want to get out of this. That's absolutely exactly, fundamental. Yeah, I mean, absolutely. It's, it's one of the main things in, like, you know, just to shamelessly bit of, do a bit of a plug for the book. It's one of the things we, <laughs> we bring in there as well. It's like, yeah, just make sure you know what your client wants and that it aligns with your goals and their goals and the audience's goals altogether. Absolutely. Absolutely. It should and it has to because otherwise, what are you like? Why? Again, it's going back to the why I was talking about this with somebody recently mm. like always like coming back to the why 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 am I doing this why am I doing this because yeah. it's easy to get you know we're, we're all about games gamification and you know occasional fun as well so yeah. <laughs> having some fun is okay in the project as long as you know you're still targeting whatever it is that you were targeting from exactly. the get-go and with of course with the agreements <laughs> of your of your client partner or whatever that looks like so exactly. that is a yeah. central and key learning is there any you know any phrase that you remember or anything of course that you can reveal that you would like to you know mention before we move on no, no sort of a key moment probably. like oh yeah i remember when i was sitting in that meeting room i showed them the whole thing and they just stared at me and said like what are you thinking about this nothing to do with what i told you i don't know like something like that i don't know if if that actually happened of course no i mean it is more of a moment of uh it was because i live in in the netherlands and they were in the uk so it was cheaper obviously to do it via video call and all of oh. that and there was this uh an awkward silence for a bit and it's like oh yeah yeah hmm <laughs> Mm. And then, you know, the penny drops, you're like, ah, <laughs> yeah, we didn't really, we didn't really connect there, did we? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So feeling that pain with you, Albert, is yeah. something that I want the, the audience to be there and to feel it as well, because it's one of the things that when you understand why you are doing all these things, and again, going back to the why, but mm. understanding why the why is so important, yeah. um, maybe you kind of convince yourself a bit more because we talk about this all the time. We say all these things and they sound like common sense. But it's really, really, really hard to get it into, like, drilled in, into your mind. So Yeah, I, and I mean, it is it is a learning journey in itself already. I mean, it's yeah. uh, if you, as a, someone who started out back then, it was like, oh, yeah, I could see this doing. And then you learn as you go along with the various clients and you, you build on that experience. So, I mean, with your other guests and all of that, then hopefully your audience can also learn from that so they don't fall into the same traps. <laughs> exactly. That's, that's the idea. So, yeah. Albert... We wanted to shift, you know, sort of 180 degrees and and go for actually one of those successful projects, something that actually went, you know, the way you want it. You didn't have that silence there. Mm. You went instead and you did your thing and everybody was happy. Again, the first, the second, the third or the fifth time, it doesn't matter. We want to, you know, live that story. You're a great storyteller. So we want (laughs) to live that story with you. We want to be there and, you know, feel those learnings and and get something out of that as well. Uh, Yeah. So one that was successful. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I'd say probably the one that's most successful that still runs, I guess, is with a with a different business school, and it's a it's also so my general sort of remit is building team oriented learning experiences, and using a medium that teaches various soft skills and incorporates whatever the business school's management program or leadership program needs to put in there. So it's a lot of things that, you know, critical decision-making, working under pressure, how to communicate effectively, how to collaborate and all of that. And I think one of the sort of successful ones that had a bit of a challenge initially was in terms of how do you get enough people to work together and keep them working together and still have the experience be scalable for different groups. And I know you work at a business school as well, so cohorts come in different sizes. So you need to have that sort of mutability and flexibility in terms of that offering of how you build that. 
So the idea that we sort of came up with me and a few colleagues around that was building a uh, an experience that used the the concept of an infomercial, like an advertising channel. Okay. And so that's the medium that it is. And then the you know people from business world, let's say for example, I think one of the first cohorts we ran it with was an entire marketing department. So they need to go in there. They do their three days of theory and you know psychometrics and learning how to be good leaders and all of that. And then you know day four, it's like okay, everyone, now you're going to put all of that stuff you're going to put into practice through developing a half an hour infomercial. And you're going to go through that for the next six hours. And at the end of six hours, you deliver it live to camera. So it's taking them straight out of their comfort zones and putting them into something that they probably hopefully enjoy. You know, it's TV, TV world. We bring a bunch of specialists in, you know, BBC people, editors, filmmakers, cinematographers, all of that. So they help them out. But yeah, it sort of it brings that all together, and that's been really successful. We've run it with several cohorts with a particular company, and they always come out of it super happy. Highly stressful during the day for them, I imagine, but once they hit that sort of thing and they've actually come together and they work as a group and they're all making decisions, they throw a few curveballs in there as well just to make it a little bit more exciting for them. <laughs> so, Being yeah, a little so. bit mean is always is always nice. Yeah, I mean, you, you need to stretch people in a, in a sense, you know, there's a, even within like the gamification and game thinking world, there seems to be this concept of, like, oh, well, it needs to be fun and therefore you need to win. But people learn from failure as well. So you need to give them a moment of where it's stressful and, you know, they fall down, but they can pick themselves up again and then they learn from that experience and then they get better from it. So you get that sort of throughout the day, there's various things that happen for that. And then the end bit is... They'll, you know, whatever they produce, it'll be a program of some sort and they'll have come together. So there will be euphoria at the end of it and they get to watch it back and it's all filmed, obviously. So they have a good time. And yeah, the I think the learning for that also sticks much longer because you have a sort of a an interconnected learning between everyone in the group. So I think that's probably one of the more successful ones that I've managed to to develop with so others. And commercials and making it exciting for for these marketing professionals, right? Pretty much, yeah. I mean, <laughs> some of the other ones are just different concepts, you know, of how course. to set up a restaurant or, you know, how to do a news program, those kind of things. So you have very various versions. But in terms of, you know, the challenge of having it scalable, the infomercial one worked quite well because you could have different products and different teams. So regardless of the cohort, it could have everyone is still involved and still having a good time and learning. Absolutely, and sounds very exciting as well. So mm. we've we've talked about a, a couple of of projects of yours. Um, we've also mentioned the book, but I and of course, having written a book, I'm sure that this will will be kind of natural in a way for you. But when you're creating these experiences, when you're doing these things, do you follow some sort of process, mental diagram? Like, how do you do it when you, when somebody comes up with this thing that they want to do? What do you do? How do you approach it? Yeah, I mean, like you say, I mean, with the book as well. So me and my co-author, we we put the process into the book as well in terms of how we go through it all. And I think it's probably a process that if your listeners have listened to some of the other specialists that you've had on here, they'll find it familiar in terms of what the steps are. It's, And I don't think it needs, you know... I guess if it ain't broke, don't fix it, or you don't need to reinvent the wheel <laughs> as long as it works and you know how it works. And you don't need to use every step and you can pick and choose as you need to be. But for us, it's very much, you know, define the objective beforehand. You know, who is it you're working with? What is the problem that they have? What is the desired outcome that they want from it? So I guess it kind of comes back to the previous question you asked me of like, what's the biggest failure? It's like, yeah, that's the main learnings for it, you know, getting the answers to those questions. And then if it's, you know, if you're working with a client that then has an outside audience, it's who are they targeting then? So obviously the book is about marketing. So there's a marketing user and consumers outside. So who are they? What do they want? How are they going to interact with what you're developing with the client? And then, you know, you're going through the basics of gamification in that sense. So what are the behaviors that, that you want them to get? You know, what are the win-fail conditions? What are the rules around how they're going to interact with whatever the concept is that you're getting? Is it gamified? Is it, you know, is it increasing a, a user experience engagement thing? And then you're moving into what does their experience path look like? What is the journey going to be for them from A to B to C? And, you know, we run through the, the usual ones that everybody loves, you know, discovery, onboarding, scaffolding, mastering, adeptness, whichever. 
And yeah, I think those are the main ones. And then for us, it's, you know, in terms of the gamification thing, it, it's not always the bringing in the mechanic or the element to make it gamified. Sometimes it's just as simple as thinking, well, how do you increase the engagement? What are the motivational levers that sit behind this experience? It doesn't need to necessarily have the mechanic that makes it gamified, you know, in inverted commas. But, you know, do people feel a purpose in this? Do they feel fulfillment out of it? Do they, you know, is there is there a level of self-control? So bringing those kind of things in there. And then naturally with the whole marketing aspect as well is, uh, you know, metrics. How do you measure it? Is it effective? Once you've done it, are people actually engaged? Did you achieve the goals that you wanted? Did the outcomes happen? Can you actually see it happen? Because if you don't have that, then you know technically you're never going to be sure if it ever happened. <laughs> Absolutely. That measuring part is fundamental and that, that kind of can feed back into a, a feedback loop or yeah. testing and so on so that you can iterate and improve, right? Exactly. It's it, it is it's about the iteration afterwards because you need to know something and how it works and whether you've targeted correctly. And it's never gonna end. You're never gonna have the perfect, you know, project or outcome for the client and it's best to have sort of a long term plan sitting around it of how you can improve it. Because you want people to engage in it in a positive way and you want to have benefit them have benefit from it. So the only way you can do that is by getting some sort of measurement and the feedback of whether it was you know, effective or not. Absolutely, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. Just a quick break before we continue with this episode. If you've been enjoying this podcast, I would really appreciate if you share it with your friends and family and on social media. On Twitter and Instagram, it's at Rob Alvarez B and the hashtag Professor Game, all one word. And in Facebook, you can find the Professor Game page. Thanks in advance for your engagement. So, Albert, what would you say is, you know, we, we've been talking about all these methodologies, about projects, etc. And, of course, you have a lot of experience. So, I would like to know if there's something, some elements, some idea. I'm not talking about game mechanics only, but mm-hmm. some idea to, to run through or some strategy that you would say, well, if you do these kinds of things or this kind of thing in your project, it will definitely benefit your, your gamification strategy. Is there something like that that you could, sort of a best practice that you could name? Sort of best practice in terms of, I think the main, the key things is uh, what we've mentioned, I'd say is the red thread in terms of making sure that goals align, your goals, a client's goals, an audience's goals, making sure that they are actually connecting in the right manner, that you're not going past each other. And not necessarily in terms of what I've recently mentioned in terms of, you know, not understanding each other of what the outcome is, but also not developing something that pushes people in one direction or another. I think one of the examples we sort of use as an anecdotal thing is like, there's no point of creating a great marketing, gamified marketing campaign that shows, you know, great teeth and beautiful people. And then your customer's thinking, brilliant, I, w- I want to have part of that. And then realize, oh, you're a car manufacturer. <laughs> I <laughs> missed the ball completely. So you need to make sure that you're hitting those things properly. And I think also there is this idea maybe of uh, among certain individuals where if it's it's if people are asking for gamification, okay, well, we need to come up with something that, that's going to make it happen. I think you also need to then have enough self-confidence and self-awareness to also go, is gamification the right tool for this project? You know, they may be asking for it, but once you've you've drilled down the thing of like what they want, do you have the courage to also then go, well, I don't think this is right for you. Can you step back? So I think that's also part of the idea of like, yeah, you need to you need to think about that. And that needs to be part of your best practice toolkit in general, you know, to have that kind of courage. Yeah. And I think in the short run, you might be if you're even if you're like pressed for clients or whatever, you mm. might say in the short run, you're kind of losing a project. Yeah, you're definitely not losing a client. You're probably winning a client for the future or exactly. a, a massive recommendation because maybe at the time he'll say, ah, oh, you know, you don't know what you're saying, blah, blah, blah. Maybe he'll go to somebody else. He'll do whatever, probably fail if that person comes in and does some gamified nonsense that, that is not going to solve the problem. But then, you know, that person is going to come back to you when he, he or she really needs gamification or when he's going to say a referral, he's going to say, well, this consultant, this guy, this company was really honest about yeah. what they, 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 you know, they skipped on, you know, invoicing me and instead told me the truth up front. Yeah, I think it's definitely a good skill to have and an awareness. 
And yeah, like you say, you, you don't want to strip mine clients just because you need them. Yeah. You'd rather have longer lasting, positive and beneficial relationships rather than anything else, I think. That's it. Absolutely. That's completely in line with sort of my, in my, at least my personal ethics <laughs> Yeah. with, you know, managing clients and that, that I could piggyback on other things, but it's not as related to gamification <laughs> in this interview. So I'm just, you know, going to shut up. I can talk for quite a while. So <laughs> we're going to move on to some of your, your favorites. And, and one right. of the things is your favorite person who you would like to have on the podcast. Somebody, you know, you've, you've heard a couple of interviews, a few interviews before you say, well, I'd really like to listen to this person. And whether he or she has been or not, because it's, you know, quite a few by now, but mm. would that person come to mind? Like after listening to these questions, is there somebody you say, ah, oh, I really like to listen to. Oh, I mean, uh, it's, that is a tough question, Rob, because I went through your whole list of, uh, of <laughs> guests you've had so far. <laughs> and I was like, oh, you know, I know like, oh, he's had that one. No, he's had that one. <laughs> I think, I think one of the few ones you probably haven't had is maybe Jane McGonigal. Hmm. I think she's quite interesting in terms of what she delivered of, you know, how to use games and how it can solve things. But I think there's also no one in particular beyond that. But I think some guests have also said, you know, maybe have more clients. And I'd also like an idea of like, you know, partner businesses who've who've used gamification successfully or unsuccessfully, you know, have their sort of case study stories, you know, bring in, you know, a marketer who has had gamification experience or a user experience designer or a data visualizer or something along those lines, you know, somebody that has a has a connecting thing to our general sector and business and has used it for a win or a fail, as it were. So I'd be interested in those kind of ideas. Interesting, interesting. I've I've heard the the guest before. Jane McGonigal was actually the first person to be requested by Yukai Chow. He, okay. She's been mentioned many times before as well, <laughs> um, and we'll probably have her, hopefully near future rather than yeah. further on. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's time to reach out. Yeah, I think so. Okay. <laughs> so also in the, along the lines, and of course, sitting right next to your book in any of of our libraries, mm -hmm. what would you say is a book that you recommend to the audience? Of course, again, right next to Press Start and your book on on marketing gamification. There's so many good books that I would recommend, and I think a lot of us probably have gone through them but I, I was given uh, as a christmas present and still going through it because it's it, it is a good book but yeah time time doesn't often allow you to finish things that you want to but i'd say misbehaving by richard thaler sort of the you know behavioral psychology and uh, behavioral economics that's uh, it's a very interesting book and i'd i'd recommend people to have a look through it Sounds very interesting, and mm. Taylor is definitely a, a, a fantastic author, and has oh, yeah. a lot of great things out there definitely, related yeah. to our field as well. Exactly, yeah. So I'd say that's uh, it's my current recommendation, but you know, give me a month, and I'll probably give you a different one. <laughs> <laughs> that's great, actually. You know, shifting through things that way, you're not just obsessed in one book or yeah. one thing, and you can move on to the next one. That's great. Yeah, that's I mean, great. it's uh, it's part of the part of the thing. You need to keep researching, keep learning, otherwise you're going to stagnate. Yeah, absolutely. And, and in that same sense of recommendations, but now going from the outside to the sort of the inside, looking mm -hmm. inside of yourself, what would you say is your, you know, superpower or that sweet spot, that thing that you do great in, in gamification and in this, this whole world? I'm not sure if it's superpowers in that sense. It'd be a bit... <laughs> I mean, hopefully yeah. better than the rest, but hopefully at least better, better than, than most. I mean, <laughs> not to be arrogant, but I think in terms of, you know... What I've already mentioned, it's the coming up with narratives and the storytelling, which is it comes from the film background and the script writing and the visual concept and storyboarding around it. I'd like to believe I do that better than the most or a fair <laughs> amount of other people. It really interests me and I get really passionate about it and I want to weave interesting stories that fully immerse clients and participants and all of that. And they really want to be part of that world. So I'd like to say that's probably it. And, you know, that might also be the dream one. The realistic one is probably I'm very good at logistics, having produced films and that. So, <laughs> you know, if that's the boring one, it's like, yeah, really good at like putting stuff together. But yeah, I think the narrative one is the, the, the one I'd like to mention more. <laughs> <laughs> And what would you say, you know, what would you say, talking about we, all the things that we've said and, you know, we, we're in the gamification world, mm -hmm. what would you say is, maybe it's part of your inspiration, maybe it's just something you do for fun, but what would you say is your, your favorite game? 
Whew, you know, that's like asking me what's my favorite movie. There's too many to pick from. <laughs> <laughs> I think uh, if I may sort of break it down into a few that I like and they have an online and offline category. Okay, okay. <laughs> online and offline sounds good. Yeah, so I'd say online one, like long, long-term long favorites have always been the Civilization series. So from Civilization 2 up to Civilization 6, I think we're at now. You know, the, the turn-based strategy game, loved it, always great. And then you, you can play it for hours and just be like, one more turn, one more turn, and then two days later, it's like, oh, <laughs> where'd the weekend go? <laughs> <laughs> what was the last turn? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> is that turn 1,000? I think in the same category, you have like the Total War and the specifically the Warhammer series as well. There's something in there as well. But for like day-to-day things, it's a quick game. I think it's Riot's uh, Team Fight Tactics, just a little bit of fun on the phone and PC and that. And then offline, you know, and this is a, it's also a sort of a personal thing in terms of like making sure you still keep up with people. And especially nowadays with like the, the COVID thing where you're stuck inside, you know, Dungeons and Dragons, having like a weekly game with friends on an online platform through that. I mean, I, it's kind of online, but it's an offline imagination game. And it's, quite, it's quite great to just like, you know, you, you meet each other, you have all your webcam on, you see everyone and you, you go into a bit of a fantasy world and you forget about stuff for a good two, three hours. So I'd say that's probably, those are my top games and favorite games that I like playing. Absolutely, absolutely. And Dungeons and Dragons is something I have said it many times before. It's one of my, you know, to-do list items to, mm. to play Dungeons and Dragons. It's definitely something I, I have to get into at some point. Oh, yeah, I, I can highly recommend it. There's, there's, there's a short learning curve, but once you get past that, it is a lot of fun. And I think, you know, in terms of, for me personally, and in, in what I do and sort of developing, you know, these team oriented experiences with a narrative, it sort of links in quite well. So uh, there's an extra professional interest as well, as you want to say. <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> I'm sure it's very useful in that sense as mm. well. And Albert, we do have a little bit of time left mm-hmm. before we take off. So I would like to, to introduce the, the random question of, of this week. And of sure. course, it makes sense, hopefully, with you. It makes sense with the audience, and it came from the audience. So All right. this one, it seems quite simple. But I, I, I can kind of see the deep side as well. And mm-hmm. it says, why do you like to use gamification? Why do I like to use gamification? Well, I mean, the short and sweet answer is probably I have been playing games since, you know, who knows when, how old I was. And there is always that thing of like, well, it's, you know, it's engaging. And gamification allows you to use those things to make it more engaging for other people. But the long answer is, I think there's it brings in so many different disciplines. And I think if you really drill down to it, and a lot of people, you know, throw gamification to the side because it's like, oh, that's like a fad. It's just adding these mechanic things and all of that. But if you go for a really good, you know, gamified, gameful thinking concept, then you're bringing in behavioral psychology. You're bringing in user experiences. You know, you're bringing in storytelling. You're bringing in so many different aspects of so many disciplines. And I think that sort of speaks to me in terms of like from an intellectual perspective, an academic perspective, and also the experiential and working with people and all of that. I think it's that sort of holistic concept of what gamification can be and should be and hopefully is for certain people. And that's that's why I like using it. I love that answer because... And and some of them have even been on the podcast already. Um, some people kind of trash gamification in a way of saying, you know, this is actually uh, what you were saying, like a fad. It's just, you know, dumping in game mechanics. And I agree that yeah. many people are doing that and saying that that's gamification. And I couldn't disagree more with the people who, who say that that's gamification mm. because they're, they're kind of destroying a, a or trying to destroy because I don't think they're achieving much. Uh, but they're no. trying to destroy a field that is... I don't know. I, I think it, I feel it can be so like rich uh, of so many yeah. things, as you were saying, behavioral psychology, um, behavioral economics. Mm. Um, there, there's the game design aspect of that. I, yeah. I don't know like where to fit that. Some people would say it's like computer programming, but not really because it's, it's not really computer programming. <laughs> no, because you can um, still use it in face to face experiences as well. You know, absolutely. game designing can, isn't necessarily digital. It's also analog. You can never have used a computer and design a game. Like, yeah. <laughs> that's been done for, for a long time. Exactly. Um, yeah. So I, I really enjoyed that answer because it's it, not only I share some of some of that, but I think we need a lot of that message mm. out there. And I have again, I have even even good friends say, saying that it, 
I've, I've kind of, you know, battled back a little bit. And then I realized, like, we're not fighting against each other. You're actually doing something that is gamification or what I might call gamification in a yeah. way. <laughs> um, uh, you're just calling it another way or I'm calling it another way of what you're calling it. Yeah. And w- we just have to agree that what we're doing is, is this is what we're doing. We can agree on, you know, the term at mm-hmm. some later point. I don't, <laughs> I don't mind. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think and, it's just that, you know, from the initial sort of, you know, in the, in the two yeah. 2000s, yeah. mid 2000s well, where gamification. Jane, Jane McGonigal was one of the ones who said, I'm not sure if she's still like in that corner. I even like recently listened to her in interview on tim ferris show Mm. um she was like literally trashing gamification like saying oh that makes no sense and they they both laughed about it and then like moved on yeah you know that little spine that strikes you like oh i mean but she's actually doing many things that that at least i would call um gamification i think she kind of shifted that that uh, approach in a way but again Possibly, i i wouldn't yeah. want to argue with any of those amazing people doing incredible work that no. i could say well that kind of thing to a client or to somebody who's never heard about this who's not an academic discussing what the term actually is you can say well that's also you know that could could be called gamification and, and it would fit fit pretty well the description yeah. yeah definitely i think it's just it's just it's just one of those things you know it's semantics yeah. in terms of Absolutely. you know what do you want to call it if it's yeah. if you call it that and you're accepting of it, then that's great. But I think in terms of what what sh- sits behind it, you need to agree in terms of like there's a richness that can be delivered. Exactly. And, exactly. and get past the initial, you know, knee jerk of like, oh, gamification. I was like, no, it's it's much more than that. We're bringing, you know, in- engagement to people. We're bringing positive experiences, you know, having people have more fun, which isn't a bad thing. You know, if they're, if they're more productive and they're having a good time, then brilliant. And they're getting a positive experience out of it. <laughs> That's amazing. Absolutely. Absolutely. And Albert, before we take off, I would like to know if you have any sort of final piece of advice or, or whatever. Of course, where we can find you, where we can find the book mm-hmm. uh, that you're, you know, you co-authored with, um, I forgot his name, Daniel, I think. Daniel was... Griffin, yeah. Griffin, that's, that's it. it. Um, where we can find the book, where we can find you, discuss some more things, say, you know, trash gamification a little bit against you. <laughs> <laughs> where we can find you in the world of the internet. Fair enough. Uh, yeah, so final message, I guess, is, yeah, just ending with that last piece, you know, make sure if you're doing gamification, make sure it's authentic. You know, just make sure that what you're trying to put out there is is true to you and true to what you're trying to do with others. And, you know, that's not only for marketing in a sense, but that's also for any sector in any industry. Just make sure goals align, authentic messages, and just have it as, you know, be a positive experience to whoever you're delivering it to. And yeah, so, and to finish it off then, where people can find me, well, my website is a good place to go if they want to check some stuff that I do. So that's uh, literally the, the letters then are aestranger.com. Uh, I'm on LinkedIn, uh, ACZ Vandermeer, Instagram, aestranger, Twitter, Facebook, etc. They can contact me there. You can find my email address on the website as well or write me a message through the website or through LinkedIn. All of that works. And if they want to have a look at the book, I can highly recommend it. <laughs> if, I mean, it's a, it's a good primer. It, it covers a lot of different things. And I think for, you know, young marketers or marketers in small to medium companies, it's it's a decent way to get your your feet wet and start understanding what gamification can actually do for a marketing campaign. And it gets, uh, it's published by Bloomsbury, so they can find it on the Bloomsbury website or they can go to Amazon. Uh, it's on, I think it's on all of the Amazons now. It's all come out on all of them. So Amazon.com, .uk, .de, all of that. Kindle, et cetera. And they can, I think, even in various countries, it'll be even in the management book things as well. Currently, it's only in English, but I think next year it might be in Portuguese. Oh, wow. Fingers crossed. So, Yeah. <laughs> That's beautiful, and I have to say, I highly commend Albert. We've we've met several times in gamification Europe. I've we've had like 
deep interesting chats about these things before <laughs> so i, I I'm, I'm pretty sure that, that that'll be an awesome book which i have promised and i'm now publicly <laughs> committing to reading the book and and saying something about what i think about it whether it's public or private i'll keep that to myself for now <laughs> all right <laughs> but i'm publicly committing i'm publicly committing very kind <laughs> so thank you thank you very much albert for investing all this time with with us with the engagers uh, with the audience or anybody else who might be listening as well However, at least for now and for today, it is time to say that it's game over. Engagers, it is fantastic to have you around. And thank you for listening to the Professor Game podcast. And I hope you enjoyed this interview with Albert. And I'd like to know if you have, like the one that we asked today or any anything completely different, do you have any future questions that you would like to ask these guests that are still not here? All you would have to do if you have your question, something that you'd like to ask us, is go to professorgain.com slash question and ask your question. If it is selected, of course, at random after passing an initial filter, it will come up in a future episode so that you can get your answer. And I would love to have you on our next episode, which I'm sure you're curious about. So all you have to do is, if you haven't already, subscribe using your favorite podcast app and listen to that next episode of Professor Game. See you there.